this opening race on Friday was just full of lifelong losers. I did know one thing is that I had a lot of concern with the favorite here, 8. Because when you look at the maiden claiming win on April 21st, he was placed first through a disqualification. So he's technically never won a race. And since that race, you know, makes a logical step to $50,000 claimers in that next event. Tries to take it gate to wire again and comes up short. Was claimed and then goes to an allowance level race, which of course claiming you're going to jump up in class. It makes sense. Doesn't do a whole lot. Tries to make that middle move again and then comes in eighth. And then drops back down into $50,000 claimers. And is just fading in there the whole way. This is a horse that I felt was really going backwards in here. And also, I felt was probably going to be our pace setter in this race with that 114 2 fifth seconds. I think the way I was looking at it to start with was, who can we eliminate? And the one was a quick toss when you look at the race two back. 50 and 4 fifths seconds, 114 and 4 fifths was up on the pace. And you can see that the 3, 4, 5, and 8 want to be up there today. This one's not quick enough, so the one was going to be a quick toss in here. The three, just not quick enough in here at the first call to really challenge what the eight's going to be able to set was a quick toss. Four is the same sort of thing. You see the maiden claiming win back here on July 1st at Belterra. 49 and 1 fifth, 114 flat to the second call. That's not going to be quick enough in here to challenge eight, so another toss. And then lastly, the nine, just not a whole lot of form coming into here. And the only win came going a mile on May 11th at Belterra, 49 one fifth, 114 two fifths of the second call. That was actually a claiming race. And same thing, up close on the lead, there's going to be three, four, five potentially other horses in here early. The nine's not going to be able to get there in that position to win the race like he needs to. So now going through, I had the two and the seven as my A horses. And the reason being I had the two was I liked the race three back at Ellis Park. You know, good move first to second call then draws off huge in there. Goes to the turf, not really his thing at all. So I was willing to draw a line through this turf race. And then when you look at the next race at Churchill Downs, that's a pretty swift pace in there. And he tried to make a move between each calls and then ends up fading to come in third out of eight runners. I wasn't holding that race against him at all, even though he is stepping up in here today, and especially considering I didn't think much of the early speed in here was going to be a factor. I, I kind of felt they always sort of take themselves out, and the slower pace or the pace meltdown potentially would benefit these off-the-pace runners. I ended up having the five in here as a seahorse, and the reason why it was first time going a route you know, I other than that, that's really the only reason why I felt he was going to be a threat in here today. Maybe the two turns for the first time could help, you know, wake him up and get him back on form. Same sort of thing, though. You can see he needs to be out in front. My only issue, the reason why I was willing to give him an excuse was just because it was a new thing for him in his career. And he's making the lowest drop in claiming price of his career. 5-2. to two, he ended up going off at 9-2 to two as a seahorse. I wouldn't win bet this horse, but I think horizontally speaking, he may have been an interesting one to include on tickets. The 6 was a B horse. I was looking at the race 3 back at Indiana. Really slow first and second call times, but was able to make a move in there to pass horses. Back at Ellis Park, same sort of thing. That was a pretty quick pace. And was able to make a move in there against runners as well. So we know... You know, you have maybe this horse is a little bit pace dependent, but we know that he can pass other horses. And again, another lifelong loser, one for 10 lifetime. I think it's also worth noting that the six is dropping back into a level that he has been able to be competitive in here. And both those second place finishes were against $10,000 claimers and $25,000 claimers. This should hit it right between the eyes for him. And then the seven, I had the same sort of thought process that I had with the two. Coming out of that same race from Churchill Downs, he actually got disqualified from second into fifth. But the slower pace potentially should help him in here today. And you can see even his last three races, 
he's been running against pretty quick first and second call times and running very competitively. And it was interesting because he ended up going off at 6-1. to one. I think he was really the only horse in here that could have given you some upside. He ended up finishing second to the eight that wins this race. So I think that was the right idea and the right handicapping route to go in this race. Look, I didn't bet it at all. I, I thought that the eight was severely over bet. I probably could and should have went with the two and the seven with win bets. What really deterred me was the fact that yesterday, I on Thursday, I pushed in way too many times and, and took some shots I really shouldn't have and got lucky with it. And then the other thing, going back through my notes I took while handicapping, I wrote right next to this race, pass, ugly race. So I really had to stick to my guns in here and, and pass the race and end up paying off because eight takes this race at even odds. Five first time starters in the second race and my A and B horses were first, second, and third choices on the morning line. The three ends up winning in here at seven to two. Makes logical sense, you know, getting first time drop from maiden special weight to maiden claiming. The cutback makes way more sense. His only good race he's ever ran in his career, even though he was fading, was on debut where he came in third in that Ellis Park sprint. You know, routing isn't really his thing, and I think that's apparent when you look two back at Kentucky Downs. He tried to go gate to wire before fading. This is a horse that needed the sprint and got the cutback and won the race. The other A horse I had was the nine, which comes down the fastest pace of anyone's last race. Makes a good move first to second call, and then gets up to finish third in that race. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is a very logical horse to play back. But at eight to five, I can see why people would want to go against a runner like this. He's coming back against $50,000 maiden claimers again. You know, very logical spot. And then the B horse I had was the six, which same thing as our winner, the three, making the drop in the maiden claiming the first time. You can see the trainers hitting at 18% with that move, getting to the dirt for the first time as well. Last time out, tried to take it gate to wire before fading. So another horse that I think makes sense getting the dirt you know, the the running style that he wants to have is going to favor the dirt. He ended up being 5-2 to two on the, as the second choice in here. So I guess of the three horses we were looking at, the longest odds won the race. But another race I had nothing to do with, with the first-time starters. We were finally able to actually open up the wallet in this race, finally, and, and make some horizontal wagers. And it's because of the eight, who ended up being the 3-5 to five favorite. And we'll get back to her and talk about why I was against her. But I think it really begins in here with early pace, as always. And I used the sixes line all the way down here, June 13th in Mountaineer. 22 and two-fifths to the first call, 45 and four-fifths to the second call. Now, a little bit of adjusting needed to be done because at that second call, she actually was off by length. So we can just call this 46 seconds for the second call. And that's why I ended up doing... And you can see that even in losses going a route, she gets there slower at the second call. But with it being the sprint at seven furlongs, I was fine with going with the 46 second mark. Because when you look at the five, the other early horse, two races back, 47 and four fifths to the second call to take that race gate to wire. That's not going to happen in here today. And this five is going to be a toss because she's just much too slow. So I felt 46 was a safe call in here going seven furlong you're going to end up seeing that there's only really two horses in here that i see that can keep up with that second call time and the first one's going to be the two 46 and one fifth seconds to the second call last time out in the win but more importantly we see the first call time of 22 and three fifths so we know that she can keep up with the early pace at the first call and she was able to do so by holding position first and second call before going on to win that race she was a b-horse closed at nine to one in here for us the three is a quick toss on the fact that you can see three back on a good track 47 seconds flat to the second call made a move positionally first a second call and then drew off to win the race by a nose now i want to go back though to the first call in that race 23 and two fifths seconds to the first call again we're not going to see that slow of fractions at the first call in this race. So we know that she's not going to be able to keep up with that pace early to make that move that she needs first to second call to win this race. 
So she was going to be a toss in here for that reason. The five we've touched on as well as the six. And then the seven was the key horse in here for me. And it's this last race. 45 and three fifths to the second call. Made a huge move positionally first to second call. Draws off to win. And then when you look at the first call, like we need to, 22 and two fifths seconds to that first call. So this horse is coming out of a race that we know is much quicker than what we're projecting in here today. And I think that's confirmed when we look at the first and second call adjustments in here. She's been racing against, you know, very honest fractions. You can see 44 and four fifths in two races and three races back. And she won both of those. I think the deterrent, though, was just where she's coming in from. You know, not as classy of of tracks, you know, into Keeneland. And I don't quite get that in a race like this because we're eliminating horses pretty quickly when we look at her lines. 3-1 to one was an absolute gift on her. And then that takes us, though, to the 8, who, again, was 3-5. to five. And when you dive into her races, you're going to see she's not going to be able to hold up with this second call time we're projecting a 46 seconds when you look just solely at this last line she ran you know holds position and beaten lanes first to second call and then goes on to win the race that was against 46 and two fifths seconds at the second call a minus seven more importantly the first call 23 seconds flat it's not going to happen in here again today for her we know that first call is going to be much too quick for her to stay up on those fractions like she needs to to win the race and when you dive in here even more to look at her other wins, you can see down here April 13th at Keeneland, 46 and 2 fifths seconds. That's a minus one. She makes a positional and beaten lanes move to win the race by three and a half lanes. At three to five, she's being significantly over bet in here because she's not beating fractions, you know, that are, that are looking to be projected in this race today. The seven is... And the two is on the way up to potentially be able to beat those fractions. The issue she's facing, though, is just going to be the class level, if she can handle the step back up in the class. So first things first, what I did in this spot was bet the two and the seven with win bets, three to one and nine to one. That's the first step. We know we're eliminating the eight at three to five, who's taken up 63% of the pool. I think that was the, the key wager in here to begin with. Then I ended up playing daily doubles because we eliminate this eight completely from the equation. We want nothing to do with her. So we're saying she's a false favorite. She's taking up a lot of money in all the pools, significant underlay in this spot again. So the daily doubles I played were seven in this leg and then three and five in the next race. And then I flipped it to seven with the three in the next race who I had as a sole A horse. Those are the daily doubles I played. And then I also want to lay the groundwork with the pick threes I ended up playing. And what I did was what I've done before, A in one leg and then all, all in the other legs. So those tickets were seven with three, five, with two, five, six, 10, 11, two, seven with three, with two, five, six, 10, 11, and then two, seven with three, five, with 11. Those were the pick three tickets I played. So you can see that we're sort of teeing up a big sequence in here that could pay off for us. But more importantly, we win the first leg in here. The seven wins this race at three to one, a key horse. We get the first leg of our daily doubles and pick threes home as well as cashing a three to one ticket in the process. When we go over to the fourth race, a little bit of positional handicapping has to be taken into account here. I want to start with the five. Three races back is the line that I wanted to evaluate everyone in here off of. 21 4 fifths to the first call, 44 seconds flat to the second call. He wasn't in first at first or second call, but he was right up on that pace. When we look at the four, we go two races back. We see 22 seconds to the first call, 44 and 4 fifths to the second call, takes that race gate to wire. I had the five as the true early horse in this race. And the reason why is because he's more than comfortable sitting just off the pace. The one has to be in front to win. We see when the one's not in front, he isn't winning, okay? So yes, the four could match this first call time that the five can set, 
but we know that the five is more than willing to allow that to happen at the first call. The second call is going to become the dominant call in here because he's four fifths quicker than what the four can run. So for those reasons, I had to toss the four and I had the five in here as a C. And the reason why is because I thought the three was just a purely a dominant horse in this race. Even though we see 44 and four fifths to the second call last time out at Ellis Park, pressed from off the pace, a length and a half off, made a positional move and beaten lanes move and wins the race. I was sold coming in from Ellis Park because again, we've touched on this many of times. Ellis Park was favoring speed. Any horse that pressed from off the pace to win, I was upgrading in here. And that's what I did in here with the three. More importantly, we're not getting a price in here, five to two on the three. And that made me like her even more because I felt eight to five was gonna get absolutely hammered in here, but that didn't happen. The one and two were tosses for me. The one was a toss for this sole reason. 21 four fifths, 44 seconds flat to the second call. Just ran with the pace the whole time in there. Not able to win against that. The win, we have to go all the way down to December 31st at Oakland Park. 45 and one fifth seconds, second call, up on the pace and wins it. So when you look at the two best races that the one has ran, he's up on the pace. It's not gonna happen in here today. We already know there's two other horses that are quicker than him at the first call. He's gonna sit at best in here third. He hasn't ran a race where he's sitting there to win, let alone run competitive. So at five to two as well, he was a quick toss for me for those reasons. And then the two, same sort of situation. You can see last time out at Churchill Downs, 44 and four fifths seconds to the second call, up on the pace the whole time. So now we're having four horses potentially that are gonna be up front you have to ask yourself the same question you have with the one now. Can he sit third or fourth in here because we know the one wants to go as well and win the race? And the answer is no. You have to go all the way down to Saratoga on the turf, sprinting where he sat third to win that race. That was against 44 and one fifth seconds. We're on the dirt today, so we can't use this line at all to evaluate this runner today. Those races are all out dashes, start to finish. You look at the dirt sprints in here, he has to be up on the pace to win. He hasn't been able to come from off of it to win. So again, another horse who's eating a big chunk of the pool, two to one was his closing price, that I felt was absolutely hopeless in here. So what I did was pretty simple. Two horse bet on the three and the five, who at six to one wins the race. I think looking at it now, I probably should have flipped the three and the five between you know, I let's put it this way. I should have had the five in there as an A horse, even though I technically bet him as an A horse. If I had him as an A with the three, these horizontal wagers become that much more lucrative for me. So first things first, we cash the six to one on the five. We also are able to capitalize on the daily doubles from race three into here. So now, so far, we're two legs through in this pick three. We've hit our key horse in the third race, which was the seven. We then hit the fourth race with the five, so we have two tickets that are alive going into the last leg of this pick three for us. I think more importantly though, is that we've been able to eliminate the favorites in the first and second leg of this pick three, as well as the daily double. Now before going forward though, to the fifth race, I did play another set of daily doubles starting in this race and they were pretty simple tickets it was three with the five ten eleven and then the three five with eleven so i was pressing my top two horses in this race with my a and b horses into the next race and then to end this pick three sequence that we have going is the fifth race i understand i'm, I'm always quick to say you know don't go after these races where you have unknown factors and i understand we had two first time starters in here, but I was very much so against the favorite in here on the morning line, which was the three. And the reason being is because of the early speed of the two. I think that this three has to get to the front to win. And you see that because of his last race. Try to take this race gate to wire. And that was against a very, very slow pace in here. Second call time of 114 four fifth seconds. 49 seconds though to the first call more importantly. When you look at the two, 
we can see two races back for him. 48 and 3 fifths seconds to the first call, 112 and 2 fifths to the second call before fading in there late to finish fourth. The 2 is going to eliminate the 3 for me. Did I think that the 2 could take the race gate to wire? Well, not necessarily, but I still wanted to have some exposure to him, and I did. And that's why I had him as a seahorse. 35 to 1 is what we had on the 2 compared to the 3 who went off as 5 to 2. Big discrepancy in odds, especially considering the 2 is way quicker than the 3 on paper. So our mark is going to be 112 and 2 fifths at the second call to see who has ran competitive races against that pace. The 4 is a pretty quick toss for me. Coming in from Belterra, slow speed figure and a huge step up in class. I want nothing to do with him in this race. The 5 was a B horse who actually ends up winning the race at 11 to 1. Look at the pace that he ran against in that race. 48 and 4 fifths of the first call, 112 and 3 fifths of the second call. Got tripped up in there first and second call, but stayed on to lose by 2 and 3 quarters of a length. This is a horse that's a clear, you know, a, a must play on the next time back. And someone that I felt offered a lot of value into this race that we got a massive price on. The 6, sort of the opposite thinking with the 6. 4 to 1 was much too short on him, but we know that he can run competitively. And you can see that over here with the 4 marks. Last race, 113 flat to the second call. Actually tried to take it gate to wire. And ended up losing in here coming in second. But two races back is what I liked about him. Because he comes out of the same race as the 5. And ran a better race. Made a positional move first to second call. And finishes fourth in there off by a length and a half in the loss. I thought he made a lot of sense. And I wanted to have some sort of exposure to him. At least horizontally speaking. And I did with the pick threes. Ended up being cold on the board at 8-1. to one. So I think the betters are kind of seeing the same thing that I did in there. The seven's a quick toss. You know, ran against pretty honest fractions last time, but did nothing in there. Comes in with no form. I want nothing to do with him. The eight was the other first time starter along with the one. 15 to one on the morning line. 20 to one is what he closed at. I had nothing to do with him. The nine, no form. Raced against faster and slower second call times. Hasn't done a thing in there. He was eliminated pretty quickly. And then the 10 was the other B horse. And I think was very logical for many people. Especially considering he ended up being 5-2. to two, Well off of the 8-1 to one morning line. And he makes sense. You see in the debut race. 48 seconds to the first call. 112 and 4 fifths to the second call. Makes a huge move in there to finish second off by a head. Then comes back in a race that was off the turf. You know, races up on the pace and finishes second, fades late in there. He's a turf horse. You, you cannot look at this last race at all, in my opinion. When you evaluate him off of his first race at Saratoga, he fits perfectly in this spot. So that's why I had to have him as a B horse. Then the runner that I targeted as the A was the 11. I felt he was the most competitive horse drawn into this field. And you look at his last race, 47 and 1 fifth to the first call, 112 and 1 fifth to the second call, makes a positional move, and he keeps on for third in that race at Kentucky Downs. Look, the Kentucky Downs angle is the reason why I had him as an A over the five, who I had as a B coming from Ellis Park. You know, looking at it now, I probably should have slid that five up as an A horse, and it would have helped me tremendously horizontally. I just felt that this 11 offered even more upside than what the five had six one the morning line seven the ones what he closed at i think the only knock you could give him is that he just hasn't won yet is he a horse that just is going to continue to lose and it appeared so because the five wins in here but you can see even back at aqueduct on april 13th 112 to the second call fourth off by length so this horse he's running against fractions that are going to be quicker than what we're projecting today it's just that is the slower fractions he could potentially see today going to be enough to elevate him into win? That's what we're looking for, and I felt slow, and that's why I had him as the lone A horse. And then the 12, last time out, I guess a mile and a half, 
one thirteen fourth fifths showed absolutely nothing. Two races back, those which you need to evaluate him on from Ellis Park. Forty eight and three fifths of the first call, one twelve and two fifths of the second call. You know, he's a deep closer, comes from well off of it, finishes third in there. I downgraded him because I just felt, you know, the other off the pace runners are much better than him in this race. And the public agrees with me. 12-1 to morning line, 31-1 to is what he ended up closing at. So right now we're keying three horses, the 5, the 11, and the 10. What I ended up doing, because I had to pick threes coming into this leg with 2, 5, 6, 10, 11 covered, I wanted to press the two biggest prices of my top contenders between the 5, 10, and 11. So I talked about pivoting, and that's how I ended up playing it. I bet the five and eleven to win, the eleven at seven to one, and then the five at eleven to one made all the sense in the world to me, especially considering I had the ten covered in the pick threes with the two and six. And again, you know, the five ends up winning the race. And then the other thing to touch on is that the daily doubles I started in race four into here lost because I had the three with the 5, 10, and 11, and then I had the 3 and 5 keying on the 11 in this fifth race. So those loss, which hurt because I ended up paying $119.28, if I just went 2 by 3, you know, I, I cover that bet and I win, I try to get more targeted and, and with smaller tickets, keying with the horses that I like the most in each leg, and that's really how I play daily doubles most of the time. And then as far as the pick threes, they hit the first ticket, which was seven with three, five with two, five, six, 10, 11. So it was seven was the key horse that we got home and then all, all in the next two. So that was very nice. And the pick three ended up paying $235 and 13 cents. So these three races, we hit win bets in each of them. We hit an early daily double and then we hit the pick three. You know, I, I can't be upset with that. Of course, you know, now I'm getting greedy and, and wishing I just played, you know, a more open ticket at daily doubles from race four to race five. That's probably begging and asking too much, but so a pretty good sequence for us to start off Friday. So coming off that pick three hit, the sixth race was a pretty logical one, I felt. And so did the public when you get down into it. So the elimination of the nine, ten, and eleven with scratches turns this seven almost into a lone speed, I thought. The race three back July 14th at Belterra, 47 and two fifths, 112 and three fifths, first to second call. Up on that pace the whole way through, actually gets passed in there in the stretch and then draws off to win. I thought that was the line we needed to look at to evaluate everybody off of in here, and even more so considering he's really the only speed left in this race. So there's some pretty quick eliminations, and one of them's the one. Comes in with no form. The two I had as an A horse, and he absolutely got hammered by the betting, making him the seven to five favorite. I felt he was better than the three who we'll look at next. The issue, though, is going to be that the second call times are sort of lacking in here, but I was giving him the excuse because he's not an early horse. If you're looking at these races three and four back, he tries to go out to the front and then fades. He's not an early horse. He wants to come from off of it. And we see that in the second race back, June 14th. I understand 113 and three fifths of the second call, but he makes a huge move in there to draw off to win. That was against $25,000 optional claimers. He then went to the turf at Saratoga against $25,000 claimers and was claimed. And he's being dropped in here today for 16. I think the drop is more important than anything. We know he can beat $25,000 claimers. So dropping into 16 should be no problem for him. And if he gets a little bit more pace early, I think that benefits him because he wants to come from off of it to win. And I think that's supported when we look at December 30th at Oakland Park. Even though it's a sealed track, 112 and 1 fifth to the second call, you know, loses a position first to second call, but ends up coming in second in that race. I think more pace for this horse, the better. And even more validation, that was a plus six and a plus nine first and second call. The win up here on June 14th was a plus 15 and plus 16. When you look at the two losses I was talking about earlier where he tried to go out to the front, those are very, very slow fractions 
in there. He's going to get to the front in there because no one else is going. And pressers that get to the lead do not win, and it's apparent with this too. So at 7-5, to five, I think he's a very legitimate favorite. So now as far as the three, I tossed him, and it's because when we look at the class level he's been racing against, he's still in here against $16,000 claimers today. We know he can beat those horses, but with the presence of the two dropping that low for the first time, you know, that should elevate this two over the three. And same thing, I think that the betting reflected that. He ended up being four to one in here off of the five to two morning line. The other factor is you can't look at these first two races because they're on the turf. So when you look at three and four back, you see three races back, one twelve and one fifth to the second call. He just kind of just runs an okay race and there's only six horses in the field. But the race four back is more telling to me. It comes from seventh. He's well off of this pace and then closes in here to win. Closers at Kingland just aren't going to win all that often. And I think that also is sort of reflected in his price as well at four to one. He has to come from well off of it. That's against the profile of the track. Four to one was dead money to me. The four is another quick toss, comes in with no form. I want nothing to do with him, as well as the five. And then the six was the other horse I had in here as a C. And for the same reason as the three, I wanted to tread very lightly. The deciding factor is that he's coming from much higher claiming prices into 16000 today. He's a closer. He wants to come from well off of it. He hasn't had a win in the last 10 races we can see here in the past performances. But we can see he's been running you know, all right races against what we're sort of projecting in here today. And especially two back at 112 and 4 fifth seconds. Runs fourth. Misses by two lengths in the end. Again, I felt, you know, he's an outside looking in horse. I think he's someone that you want to have exposure to horizontally at least. But win ticket wise, not really. Especially considering he went off as 9-2. to two. That's sort of the minimum I think you should be looking for for a closer. Especially here at Keeneland. Even though as a seahorse, I'm going to need much more of a price than that to even think about betting him to win in this race. And then lastly, the 8 coming in with kind of just up and down form. Even these good races within bad races is him just passing horses late he hasn't shown a whole lot in these two races since coming off of the turf back to dirt races to really prove anything so again it was a pretty simple wager for me I had the seven who was at six to one on win tickets as well as the two at seven to five and the two ends up winning this race i think it was like i said pretty straightforward handicapping affair i think the only thing you had to get around was the presence of the three, and I think a lot of people did, considering he ended up going off at four to one. The seventh race was, you know, I wrote down on my notes wide open after handicapping it initially, and the winner ends up being in our A horses, but I think there were so many in here that could run to the projected pace that I think I ended up making the right call betting-wise in the end. But the with the scratch of the eight, the one becomes our true early horse in here. 47 and two fifths of the first call, 111 and four fifths of the second call. You can see he took that race gate to wire, and the second call time, 111 and four fifths seconds. There's plenty of them in here that can run to that, and that's why I ended up saying this race was pretty wide open. The two I actually did eliminate, but you could even see just the first two races popping up: 111 and one fifth, 109 and four fifths. And each of those races runs second off by half a length and then won the race two back by a nose coming in from Canterbury and Ellis Park just really the decision is you have Kentucky down horses coming in here and you're going to see some of them have some absolutely dominant pace lines that bury this two so for that reason I ended up tossing the two in here if, if you eliminate those other runners I think the two would be very logical but with the other pressers in here that are much better that's why I ended up having to toss the two the three was a seahorse, and two races back is the reason why. 111 and 1 fifth seconds to the second call. Makes a good move positionally first to second call. Draws off to win that race. Goes to a grade three at Kentucky Downs last time out and shows nothing. The drop back down out of that race you know, is going to make all the difference in the world for this horse. So I felt, you know, obviously outside looking in yet again as a seahorse, the one that made a lot of sense ended up being 14 to 1 when things closed the four has no form whatsoever you don't even want to dig into a horse like this especially when we know so many are in form and can win in here today 
And then the five is who I felt was the best horse in the race, and so did the public. He ended up being two to one. When looking at the second call times of these last races, you see 111 and two fifths, three back 111 and three fifths. You know, he's winning races and making positional moves in here against fractions that we're projecting today. And again, when we talk about the one, we also have to remember that first call time we're saying should be 47 and two fifths seconds. Now you see that's essentially the pace that this five just won against last time out at Pimlico, 47 and two fifths, 111 and two fifths, the second call, you know, huge speed figure. And I think conventional handicapping would say, you know, this is a horse that should bounce. He's in such good form. It's hard to knock him against this field. Moving over though to the seven, Tis the bomb. I mean, we've seen this horse run so many times and absolutely burn money. Doesn't have a win in any of his last 10 races. Went nothing to do with him. The nine was the other A horse that I was targeting in here. And this is why. The last race at Kentucky Downs, 44 and three fifths, 108 and four fifths to the second call. Makes a positional move, loses by a head in there. That pace was absolutely flying. And you see that with the plus 15 at the first and second call you know he's coming out the fastest pace of anyone last race i think he makes a lot of sense getting the slower fractions projected in here that the one will give today yeah I, hard to knock a horse like this even though he hasn't been able to win against it if he can build you know somewhat even off that race he's going to be a serious threat and i think the rest of the public felt the same way eight to one no shot we were getting that nine to two is what he ended up closing at the 10, quick toss, you see the win, three back at Turfway, 112, makes a positional move to win that race. 112 is going to be way too slow in here today, you know, easy elimination for that reason. And then the 11, you see coming out of that same Kentucky Downs race, 44 and three fifths, 108 and four fifths, second call, loses position, but then comes on late to finish third in that race. Actually, it was his second time ever on the turf. And, you know, same sort of thought process. If he can build even slightly off of that race, he's going to be he's going to be a big number that can potentially win this race. And that appeared to be so because he ended up closing at nine to one. I don't quite get the difference in odds between the nine and the 11 in here. They're coming out of the same race. And I think this is one of those things as a better you kind of have to keep, you know, your eye open for both these horses ran essentially the same race in here I get the nine almost one I think that's why it's so important to look to play the odds in races like this because you're getting pretty much double the price on the 11 compared to what the nine is giving you and neither of them won the race I could see if someone set the fractions early and then faded you know we have two horses that are pressers and it's just going to come down to who's better at the end of this day and to me, I'm going to take the horse that has the higher odds. I, th I think that's the logical thing to do in a race like this. And then moving over to the 12, I had him as another seahorse. And it was because of this last race. 111, four fifths of the second call. You know, finishes second, off by two lengths. Holds position first to second call. Cuts to the beaten lanes by length. His race last time out is what we're projecting in here today. And we can see that he can run competitive to it. He hasn't been able to win. But I think you don't want to eliminate a horse that's running very competitive races against what you're projecting today. And I think even more reason so is because when you look at June 1st at Churchill, 47 and 4 fifths to the first call, 111 and 4 fifths to the second call, you know, same thing. Presses from off of it, actually takes a lead and stretch and loses by a length in there. So I felt another horse that makes a lot of sense. And horizontally speaking, I think he's a must include even as a seahorse because he's seen these fractions before and he's proven that he can handle them his best races are when he has a second call time you know quicker than 112 he ended up being 16 to 1 when it was all said and done and then lastly the 14 actually drew in i wanted nothing to do with this 14 you can see the last two races sub 112 hasn't done a thing so a pretty quick toss for that reason now the issue i had was just splitting hairs and I felt that this five was serious. Uh, two to one, he's a serious player. I think betting wise, if I wanted to bet this race, I would have bet the nine and the 11. That's what I've been doing all me long. And, and that's how I play. What I didn't like though, 
is that this five is proven against the exact pace that we're gonna see today. He should be able to sit, you know, right there for the mid pack like he wants to. I think this is as legit as a legit favorite gets. It ends up being true because he wins the race. The 11 actually comes in second, so we were correct handicapping wise by saying that the 11, you know, could build off that last race, and he did. So, you know, maybe. Maybe I kick myself, you know, I think most people would think, well, you know, you're, you're dumb. Why wouldn't you just bet the nine and 11 to win and then play the exact of five over the nine and 11? Well, you would have been right, I guess, in this sense, but I don't really play vertical wagers like that. I've tried and I, I just, it's just not my strength as a handicapper. So, you know, maybe a race that I should have hit, but I ended up passing because I had three horses that I thought would maybe give odds to play which they did but I just couldn't narrow it down out of those three for win bets nine horses going two turns for the first time in the eighth race quick toss race for me right off the bat you know I want nothing to do with these sort of races the nine ended up winning this race I had as a b horse was two to one when it was all said and done you know it makes sense you can see the positional move she makes in that sprint race and pretty swift fractions on top of that I had the four on top as the a horse and you can see the same thing coming out of Saratoga has an excuse last time out by hitting the gate but that first race you see up on it takes the lead in the stretch before fading in there late getting caught three to two favorite you know I think this race was bet very accurately by the public so, you know, not much I would do in here, and, and I don't think much that many would do in here unless you singled up on this nine. I'll be honest, this ninth race, mile and a half on the turf, I'm not not the best of handicappers at these, but the reason why I ended up putting a speculative wager out there was because I had the six and seven as B horses, 17 to one, and then the seven went off at 15 to one. I liked both of them. You see two races back for the seven, Took this mile and three eighths race, gate to wire. I was thinking maybe he could get out and blitz this field as the five, the other early horse in here, has actually already lost to him in that same race at Saratoga. So at six to one on the morning line, five to one is what he went off as. You know, I felt he was a good fade in here. And especially because we're getting 15 to one on a seven and the horse has already beat him gate to wire. So for that reason, I liked him. And then the six, the race two back at Ellis Park, even it was a mile and a fourth, you know, pretty hot fractions and stayed up on it the whole way through. I was just trying to steal this race on the front end. The three ends up winning, and, you know, it's no secret. Bold act, five to two on him. Like, speculative wager, not a whole lot of handicapping. I was just playing the two longest odds horses. In the end, five to two was probably a gift on this horse, but to me, I wanted to play these two price runners that I really looked to target considering I had them as B horses in my initial handicapping. You know, I wanted to press maybe my luck, I guess you could say, in here and try to get one more, you know, bomb home. But, you know, small wager, so not not too detrimental at the end of the day, but one that I probably should have passed on. And then the close things out on Friday was this 10th race, which had absolutely no pace. Had to go all the way down here to the 11 because of the scratch of the two and you already see the second call time I have circled there 46 and two fifths seconds last time out lost by half a length in there you know usually I say pressers they get to the front don't win this is a horse that we can see when we go all the way back to June 19th at Monmouth he's won on the front before so getting to the front isn't going to hurt him I felt as a seahorse he had a big shot in here to win and at seven to one you know, I think he was very fair odds because I, he was really the only early confirmed speed in this race. So at 46 and 2 fifths seconds is kind of what we're looking at to evaluate everybody else. The three I ended up tossing, and you can see two races back, 46 and 3 fifths seconds, ran up on that pace, lost by a length. But more importantly, you look three back, 44 and 4 fifths, made a beaten length move first and second call and wins that race by a head. That's the line that puts him into the winner's circle today because he ends up winning it at 5-2 to two and snapping us in here. Again, my thought process, look where he's coming from. You know, These aren't tracks that shippers are coming to Keeneland 
to compete against. Clearly, I was well off on this, and I was trying to take advantage of him at being 5-2, to two, which I thought had no hope in here. But going forward, we're going to see the 4 has been racing against Quicker, just not winning. If you go all the way down here, December 16th at Oakland Park, 47 and one fifth seconds. That's the last time he's gotten the winner's circle while sprinting. I eliminated him for that reason. The five I had as a B horse, and the reason why is the last two races, 46 and one fifth, 46 and three fifth seconds. He's ran okay races in there, nothing too crazy, but I felt made a lot of sense considering he's making moves at each call in here. So this is a horse that's going to just plug along and, you know, try to just run his way up into first. Didn't happen. I probably should have seen that, especially considering you look at his lifetime stats. Three wins, five places, and seven shows. You know, he's a backwards horse. He's a horse that you key on underneath in races like this. Came down a little bit from his morning line. Ended up being 5-1 to one when it was all said and done. The six I eliminated quickly. No form coming in here. I'm not you know, I'm not looking to stretch to find a runner in a race like this. The seven, same sort of thing almost, even though two back on the turf. He ran a good race, but that's a route. We're sprinting in here today, and you can see him getting back to a sprint last time out and did him no favors. He faded the whole way in there. And I actually gave him a no form for that race, even though he finished in the money. Only five horses, so... It's hard to give a horse, you know, a, a positive race when from just the jump they're getting absolutely blown out against a short field. Also, claimed last time out, moving up in the claiming price, not going to help him at all. The eight, quick toss, no form. I want nothing to do with him. The nine, same thing, comes in with absolutely no form, cutting back. Not going to be a positive move in this race. The ten is who I had on top. And the race three back is why 45 and three fifths seconds, second call, makes a positional beaten lengths move, draws off to win that race by two lengths. That was against $32,000 claimers. He dropped into $25,000 claimers on a sloppy track, so you can give the excuse for the performance. Then he went to a turf race at a route at Ellis Park against $25,000 claimers again, up on the pace early, and then faded late. Going to a route wasn't what he needed to do. He needs to stay in here sprinting, and that's what he does again today. Dropping the $20,000 claimers. We know he can win against $32,000 claimers sprinting. You know, I felt that's all that was really needed to get him as a legitimate contender in this race. Everybody else felt the same as well. 5-2 to two as well when the gates opened. How I bet this race... I have three horses I like. I took the two longest shots in here. I had the 11 at 7-1 to one with win bets. And then I took the 5 at 5-1 to one with win bets. I bet on both the win, Dutch bet, obviously. Doesn't matter. The three ends up winning this race. A horse that I know I never would have gotten to. I'm not going to stress it. I had a good day. No need to get worked up trying to figure out how this horse wins, even though when we go back, we can see that third race puts him right there into the winner's circle.